So, ladies and gentlemen, we've just been talking about some of the motivations for modeling. And I talked about how models are specific to purpose. And for different purposes, we build different models. And I also alluded to the fact that there's different languages and ways of specifying these models all share the certain features. They're all about dynamic models. They're all about depicting kind of processes, often our working hypothesis to processes in the world and, and often depicting, typically depicting complex systems where we can simulate them over time. It's not really a, a visual depiction as valuable as that is to welcome critique. It's a depiction that's precise. Um, Again, not always to say accurate, but precise, you know, very specific, specific enough that it can be run, that it can be um, simulated. Um, and uh, by simulating it, we often learn a lot. Um, we learn what the logical consequences are of those assumptions by behavior over time and sometimes over space and over networks, how it spreads in a network, et cetera. Um, uh, all those shared those those features. Um, but they differ in, in the sorts of processes that they're best designed to depict. And we're going to look at three major methods for engaging in uh, dynamic modeling. Two wet system dynamics method or compartmental modeling, um, which is in traditionally, it's most commonly used at an aggregate level or counting the number of people say are susceptible or or infective right now, or recovered, or people are undiagnosed by diagnosed. These are counts. We're not keeping track of, of specific individuals. It's, over time, it's giving us what we say is a cross-sectional depiction of the population, how many people are in each of these states. Um, but it focuses on feedbacks and accumulations. It is a very rich semi-qualitative or semi-quantitative um, set of depictions known as causal loop diagrams. We actually saw one earlier. Um, and uh, a long tradition of having participatory modeling where we build models in, together with, with experts and stakeholders. Um, system dynamics also has exact mapping onto um, what are called differential equations, ordinary differential equations in particular, um, differential equations that involve derivatives with respect to time, um, so rates of change. And for this reason, we can actually do get tremendous insights. Like under what conditions, you know, in the endemic era that's coming, likely post Omicron, will Saskatchewan be in a in a robust, stable state? If you know a busload of people were to drive in from another province um, with Omicron or or with you know any later variant, to what degree would our health system? Be stable to what degree would it undergo a big, um, big outbreak, and where would it end up if we had a big outbreak? We can actually solve for these things, um, and, and as we say, solve for them in closed form. Like, what are the criteria for stability? Maybe it has something to do with how quickly we discover them and how quickly we treat them, and and our ability to limit spread quickly through local measures or what have you. So that's system dynamics modeling. We're going to talk about agent-based modeling, um, depiction at an individual level of one or more populations of, of individuals, individuals whose behavior we can follow, whose histories we can follow, interacting with each other and with the environment. Um, they can be very different from each other, something that's hard to capture in, in aggregate system dynamics. Um, and we can arrange them in networks and in geography and have them you know, move around and, and interact and, and transmit infection and, and they can make decisions based on their local, what they see from their local situation, much as a car driver makes decisions about when to break based on what they see right ahead of them. People often make decisions, say about health matters, whether to get tested based on what's going on in their network, right? If someone else close to them has gotten diagnosed, or has got a really bad case of the sniffles or, or a shortness of breath, they're more likely to get, to get tested. Um, so often we make decisions in localized ways. And agent-based models can capture this really, really richly. And we can even have 
um, uh, hierarchical models where we have, you know, within uh, Canada, we have provinces. Within each province, we can have, you know, regions. And within each region, we can have municipalities. And within each municipality, we can have homes and workplaces and schools and long term care facilities and acute care facilities like hospitals, blah, blah, blah. So um, we can capture those in agent based models, kind of a nested hierarchy, similar to what we see in the world. And finally, discrete event simulation, um, which will depict structured workflows where your progress it depends on resources available. Think you're going to the ED these days. You need to go to the wait in line for the triage nurse. And so you need that resource to progress to the stage where you're even waiting in the waiting room to be seen. And then, you know, you'll be triaged. And once you, once the physician or nurse, uh, probably typically a nurse will come get you and help escort you to a bed. There has to be a bed available. And the nurse has to be available to work with you there. And then, you know, eventually an ED doc will come and they'll examine you, et cetera. So these are all resources that are needed for you to progress through a set of stages. And so it is with discrete event modeling, with these workflows and stages we progress through. And we ask, you know, how long are people waiting and how, what, how long is the long line length and how many resources do we need to make sure it doesn't bottleneck, it doesn't break down given staff shortages because they're getting sick with Omicron. Omicron. It's, it's a huge issue right now. Um, and, uh, and we have exactly the tools to look at them. And those are the sort of tools we build to look at things like ED wait times and patient flow in, in, uh, within the, the province. And indeed, many of our models for COVID-19 build these in. So we're gonna talk about those three types of modeling, system dynamics modeling, uh, agent-based modeling and discrete event modeling. And then we'll see how we hybridize them. And that constitutes a lot of the focus of this course right there. So let's, let's uh, switch over to that if we may. Um, so I'm going to go to my slides for that. Um, each of these types of modeling is good at depicting certain types of structure. Models here are all about capturing structure with respect to the world and seeing the logical consequences of that structure. And each of these three types of simulation provides us a natural way, a wonderfully concise and, and um, rich way of describing certain types of structure. And if we're dealing with a system that has diverse types of structure, often we'll weave together multiple types. Um, okay, um, so um, we've spoken about um, dynamic models and, and we talked about some of their, their uses. Um, um, these models all depict the a behavior of a system over time. They all depict how the system would evolve over time. This is another commonality between them. Um, and we can't pre-specify that. We can't just solve what it is, you know, a year from now, two years from now. In order to do that, just like with a Turing machine, you can't figure out whether a program's going to halt without running it and running it and running it and running it uh, ad infinitum. Um, it always could be one step more it needs before it halts. So it was with a simulation model. In order to, you know, depict the situation in the next few years, you have to simulate the next few years. Um, the models across all three of these types will simulate incremental changes. Given the current situation, the state of the system, the current situation in the system, how will things change over the next little bit of time? And, and the behavior of the system is emergent. It, it results from it. It kind of um, uh, is generated by it. Remember, a system is more than its pieces. It's about the interaction of pieces that give rise to behavior. Um, and because uh, underlying systems that we're working with typically exhibit nonlinear characteristics, so do the models. And what this means is, is like um, uh, you, you just can't figure out from the pieces alone um, why certain behaviors come. It, it's just like you, again, by looking at those cars, you can't figure out why a traffic jam uh, is observed. Now, a common concern also in all of these is the model scope. And I'm going to give you three categories, and you need to know these. I can almost guarantee they're gonna be on the final exam as well for the undergrads. Um, we divide up things in the model into, um, or it could be in the model in three categories. Things that are 
the model produces, it generates them, it gives rise to them. These things are called endogenous things, okay? The model is generative. We don't tell the model what about them. It's producing them. Maybe this is the number of cases of infection over time. We want the model to anticipate how many, how many new people are infected per week, maybe, or how many hospitalizations there will occur in a given week, uh, what the prevalence of Omicron is at any one time as a fraction of all variants uh, among, among cases or, or what have you. Um, uh, we generate it. Often these are things we can't directly observe, like the number of undiagnosed people, um, but we expect the model to kind of, given our assumptions, our, our kind of theory is captured by the model to produce behavior over time with respect to this. So those are endogenous things. The model's producing. It's telling them to us. There's another category of things called exogenous things. These are things which are represented in the model as well, but they are represented in a pre-specified way. Maybe they're just fixed constants. We, maybe we assume for our model, there's a fixed diagnosis time you know, before someone with symptoms is found and comes in for testing. Um, maybe there's a fixed chance that they'll come in for testing. The model's not changing that over time. It's not saying, oh, if there's lots of people known to be sick in the population, people are more likely to go get tested. Or it's not saying, oh, there's a long waiting line. The number of people needing testing is too long. So people drop out and they won't get tested. Um, those would be endogenizing it. But exogenous would just be when we make a fixed assumption. Maybe it's an assumption about how many people a given infective runs into per day. You know, um, And again, maybe it's pre-specified. Or the probability that if Two people are in a room together that, you know, one's, as we say, it's a discordant pair. One is infective and one is susceptible. What's the chance the, the infective one will transmit it to the susceptible one? Um, those are endogenous things. The model captures these assumptions, but it does so in a way that is fixed. Uh, it's pre-specified. When I say fixed, I've got to be careful. It's pre-specified. Maybe it, maybe we say, you know, each successive month, um, means there's longer waits. We could specify, pre-specify that, but it's not generated by the model. We tell the model ahead of time what to assume. That's the key thing. And then there's a set of things that are ignored, consciously omitted from the model. We say, look, you know, I'd love to put in something about the mental health effects associated with COVID, but this model is not the place to do it. Or I want to put in something about the, um, you know, the, the uh, limited... Um, sensitivity of antigen tests, but we're going to leave those out, um, uh, perhaps, for example. Um, okay, um, or we're leaving out people coming from other, pro other provinces into Saskatchewan. Um, so when we have a model, having more things that are endogenous, that are generated by it, often allows greater generality, flexibility, investigative power. You can, can kind of look at more things. You can, it's a more versatile lens, but it also requires more time and resources to build, to ground it, to, to put in the assumptions about it. And often it's more challenging to reason about. There are more moving parts and it's harder to understand why is it getting these behaviors? Okay, so we're gonna talk about three modeling traditions where all these things are true and why we use models and, and broadly what they depict. Okay, so what is system dynamics? Um, system dynamics is a feedback oriented perspective. It's a, it's a perspective that focuses on two big phenomena. Feedbacks, cases where change ripples around and either comes back and amplifies the original change or pushes back against it. That's one thing it focuses on, feedbacks. And the other thing is accumulations, um, things that kind of build up and decay over time. Think, uh, think about for, I'll be with you just a second, Anuj. Um, think about for uh, feedback cases where, you know, one infective leads to others being exposed, getting infected leads to more infectives. That's a vicious cycle, right? It's a it's a reinforcing feedback. One infective person, one infectious person breeds two, breeds four, 
disputes eight in heinous succession. succession. There can be um, other types of feedback that are balancing, as we'll see. With accumulations, well, you know, the, the number of people who are recovered over time is accumulating. Um, number of people have gotten vaccinated over time is accumulating. And there's a lot of phenomena in the world that we see that involve accumulations um, uh, from, a, from a health side. And system dynamics is a uh, methodology. It's a broad evolving methodology. Some even use the term field for it, though I tend to disagree, to conceptualize, describe, analyze, and manage complex, these feedback-based systems and provides this way of thinking about them, visualizing them, and describing them, analyzing them, and, and in fact, managing them. So Anuj had a question. I welcome your question. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, so for those like model categories you're just talking about, mm -hmm. you mentioned the endogenous model, the... Uh, ex mm -mm. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but I should... Maybe this will help your question. These are actually not model categories. It's within a given model. Okay. But when we think about what's, what's in the model, and when we think about what's its scope, what's its... Um, like. What, what, what's inside of it? We divide up the things with respect to that model into these three categories. We, we consciously think, what is the thing the model's gonna produce? What are the things that I'm gonna pre-specify to this model and what are ignored? So every model will have these three categories of things with respect to it. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, that, that answers my question, thanks. Okay, yeah, yeah, you bet. Uh, wonderful question. Um, anyone else wanna ask a question here? I, I see there's... Maybe something in the chat. Um, um, uh, um, where might edge case data uh, fit into the scope categories? Uh, where you give the model starting value, which is then altered. That'll be considered an endogenous value. If it's being altered over time by the model, it's generating that. Generally, th that's almost invariably going to be an endogenous quantity. Yeah. And generally, that's what we do. We give the model an initial value, and then it evolves over time. That's what a dynamic model does. It has some initial situation state, and then it evolves. Okay, and at any one time, the state with respect, the current state will depict what happens, what can happen in the model. Um, wonderful things. I'm, I'm seeing some more questions, so let's let's try to let's try to get to them. Um, uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, okay, I, I saw two two questions here. Um, uh, so Anuj, um, and then uh, Larissa. So Anuj, yeah. So Anuj, maybe put down his hand. Yeah, that's that's what that was. Sorry about okay. that. Larissa, yes. Um, so I'm just curious, kind of, because I feel there's a lot of terminology overlap from what I learned back in 371 in the olden days to what is here. And I'm curious how, like, you sort of, if it's possible or feasible to, like, sort of model uh, those kind of loops that we did back then. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, there's quite a literature on that. Um, so yeah, um, we, we software projects are a complex system and there's been a lot of interest in modeling software project dynamics um, using simulation models um, of the sorts listed here. I think all three types have been used to model software projects, system dynamics, agent-based modeling and discrete event simulation, each been used to some degree in simulating software projects and asking what if questions. Like what if we don't institute enough testing or what if developers didn't give testers um, you know, code early enough? Um, and so testing was all squeezed in at the final time and so much of their testing had to be put into place to you know, um, deal with merge conflicts, imagine that. Um, or, or suppose we were to put in place an agile methodology uh, with faster uh, cycles, like um, you know one week sprints versus three week versus you know two month sprints. How would that affect things? We, you know, how if we could have more testers? Um, what if we could have um, tester paired with developers? All those, yeah, you can you can simulate all those sort of things, and and it's a good use of simulation models. And there's been quite a bit written over the years on on how to use simulation in the sphere, even in particular areas like system dynamics models of software. So yeah, there's great opportunities there. And um, I will say it's indicative of 
use across many uh, disciplines. So whenever you see, you know, important projects that have real consequences, whether it's construction or energy related projects, projects or, you know, manufacturing or software development, people are are going to be using simulation modeling one place or another within that field. And there's whole companies that are set up to do consulting in those areas or, or advising of, of companies or, or, you know, large companies that do it for their own operations. So yeah, this is, uh, this is big business um, in that area. And it's one of the big users of any logic, in fact. So there's a question from Jake here. Hi. Um, yeah. So I was just curious, are there any, and I, I, I you don't have to like give the ratios if they do exist because they wouldn't mean anything to me now. But are there any kind of like rule of thumb ratios between like the endogenous, exogenous, and ignored quantities that people try and follow in their modeling, just so that you don't have like very little mm -hmm. controlled things and a lot of extra things coming out that might not be totally accurate? Um, it's a good question. I mean, this this, I mean, generally speaking, um. We want to be cautious about how many endogenous things we want to put in for a given model. Um, yeah, I mean, not to say there aren't some with tons of endogenous things, um, but you, you need to really know what you're doing and it's best to build those models incrementally. Um, just like it's good to build a software project incrementally. Um, we talk about agile modeling, just like we do agile software development and you want to build it up um, slowly. So generally you'll start with just a few of each category um, uh, of the first two, uh, endogenous, exogenous. Um, and then we will, um, uh, and, and often we have a large laundry list of things that are ignored. Uh, why do we list them? I mean, they're, they're not in the model. Well, yes, we consciously thought about them and we list them, look, we're putting this in the parking lot for now. Maybe later we'll, we'll move it into the model. We often list those things, you know, we, we think are potentially important, but we don't want to start there. Starting simple in many things in life is, is a good recipe for success or at least low risk. And um, you want to start simple with a model with just a couple endogenous things and a couple exo exogenous things that govern them. Typically, there's more exogenous things than endogenous. But some of those over time get endogenized and some things that are ignored get exogenized and then endogenized sometimes. So there's often a progression like this. Occasionally you'll see, we say, oh, you know, we put this in, it didn't make much of a difference when we did sensitivity analysis and we ran it. It was a lot of work to put it in, you know, the model, required, a, it grew a, a lot in size and it wasn't worth it. We're going to put it back in the ignored category. So you get shifts among these categories over time. Broadly, there's somewhat, typically there's somewhat fewer endogenous things to exogenous things. Maybe it's you know uh, a ratio of one to two or one to three or something on that order. And then there can be a lot of ignored things. I mean, you can go to town with this. You can spend huge amounts of time thinking about things that are not in my model. That generally isn't that useful, just like if you're doing a risk list for, for risk analysis, you know, like what's going to every possible risk isn't useful. You focus on the ones that are most germane and, and closest at hand. And so you, um, you know, the ignored one is kind of a more variable one, how detailed you go, but generally you try to keep it limited. The one that really makes the most difference often is um, in, in, in kind of model evolution is between exogenous and endogenous. And then some of the flows from the most important ignored to each of those. I don't know if that's helpful. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're actually uh, over time now. Um, so what I think I'm going to do to make sure we're not held up, I have a video of me talking about each of these methods. And I'm gonna ask you to watch that video before our next class on Tuesday. Um, it goes through these three types it walks you through their salient differences and talks about each of them and on tuesday we will talk about that video um and i may ask questions about that video it's even possible i may ask questions in a formalized way about that about said video so uh, i'd like you to look at that video and um we will uh discuss uh trade-offs a little bit between those uh types of 
of modeling methods that we'll be seeing, okay? Um, uh, very good. So um, we're, we're out of time. I wanna be respectful of people's time, particularly because you may have a class here right afterwards. I wanna remember people that after a short break, I will be holding office hours now, okay? And I'll ask you to go over these, uh, these uh, trade-offs over the weekend. I'll post a, uh, a video link uh, before the end of the day is my plan. So uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If there's any burning questions on your way out you wanna ask, I'm glad to answer them now. Uh, otherwise we'll, we'll have a health break.